one when I got home. Last That's time. Totally cool. yeah, they gave me a whole box. Of I always get our trade on. these off last time, and I really wished I would have, but Neil does an excellent job with her quilts. Uh, this is Summer's graduation quilt. Like I said, all the other graduates got one of these. She does a great job. She works really hard on it, and we appreciate her very much. Some of our fathers before we get going into 
our singing time, and I need my man up here. Tanner, come on up here. <laughs> so I'm going to do this as we have fun with this every year, and we do it with the mothers too. But the fathers, here we go. Ready? So we want the oldest dad here today. <laughs> the oldest father. Anybody? If you're over 80, stand up. Please. Over 80 years old, stand up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. I hate to admit it. <laughs> so, I mean, okay, how, how old are you, Jim? Let's call it out. I'll be 83 in September. So that means you're 82. What are you, a teenager or something? Yeah, I'll be 16 next <laughs> Alan, how old are you? Twenty-five, twenty-six. 26. I'm only 30 now. Though, so. I, <laughs> huh? I said I can compete with the 17, 18. Yeah, but you got to get a car back. Anybody? <laughs> can he? All right, way to go. <laughs> and this is, by the way, this is a gift card to Lowe's. I figured the dad would appreciate it that more than Dunkin' Donuts or something. <laughs> something for all dads today and it's really cool. It's a, a dollar wrapped up in a, in a little folder and what I want you to do with that dads, I want you to keep that, put it on your mirror in your car or somewhere and every time you look at that you remember your children and say a prayer for them. It's really a neat thing and I thank Connie for putting these together. That was a lot of work. And so every dad gets one of these on the way out today. So God bless you all. Okay, Charles. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I hope I've been around some time, Alan, but, but I could be the oldest dad. Maybe that'd be all right. Yeah. Good thing to hope for anyway. Okay. Hey, let's all stand and sing. This is today. Here we go.
This is my body which is given to you. Do this and remember to me. In the same way he took the cup of the wine after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant between God and you. Sealed by the shedding of my blood. Do this in remembrance as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. We're all familiar with that passage from Corinthians uh, 11, chapter 24 through 26. As we come to the communion table, there are three things we should remember according to 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 30. First, we should look back. We are participating in communion in remembrance of Christ. Though we must be reverent and must be appreciative of what the communion symbolizes, communion also speaks of intimacy <coughs> and fellowship. And so we look back. We look back to the cross. We remember what Christ accomplished for us, and we are reminded of his love for us. Second, we are to look ahead. The scriptures say to do this until he comes again. The first time Jesus came to this earth, he came as a suffering servant. The next time, he will come as the conquering king. Communion is an observance to remind us that Jesus will come again. Third, communion is a time to look within. We are to look within and ask the Holy Spirit to show us any areas of our life that may not be pleasing to God. Once we acknowledge these areas, we are to repent of these sins. To fail to do so and then take part in communion is to eat and bring damnation to yourself. As the King James Version reminds us, or it is to eat and drink, not honoring the body of Christ. So come to the communion table in joy. Come in reverence. Come in honesty. If there's something that isn't right, this is the time to deal with it. Communion is the ideal time to make a commitment or read it. Dear God, as we gather around the table, let each one that takes communion go deep within that quiet place within your heart where only they can talk to Jesus. Let them know the peace that comes from knowing you. Dear Lord, all believers are invited to take communion. We gather around the Lord's table to honor Jesus and all he did for us. In his holy name I pray.
it all belongs to you, God. But we are honored to give back to you. Dear God, I pray that the, these monies be used in the furthering of your church. Make it a beacon of all the hill and make wise decisions be made to further your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. to all those names on the prayer list, I have a couple more cards, if you would keep these in mind, please. <coughs> Chris Richardson will be traveling to Europe, and maybe he's already traveling, I'm not sure. Ralph Wilson, that's Katrina's boss, uh, is having heart surgery in Wednesday, so let's remember these individuals. And are there others who are not on the prayer list you'd like to add? I have one. Please pray for Alyssa Howard. She's four years old. She was kidnapped by her mother this morning at church in Mountain City. Melissa? Alyssa. Alyssa.
Justin McConville. Justin McConville. Nikki Peterson. And that first name you gave a while ago was Cody. Anyone else? Anyone have a uh, have some good news you'd like to share? I believe so. If there are no other names or additions that you want to uh, mention, let's pray together, please. God, we thank you for this time to come to your house. We ask you to forgive us where we fail. We ask you to accept our thanks for all the blessings that we enjoy, spiritual and otherwise. We thank you for our fathers. And may we ever be mindful of them, whether living or not. We thank you for this place we can worship freedom that we have to worship. May we never lose it. And we pray for all those around the world who don't have it, all those being persecuted. We ask for changes. And we ask for good news from around the world. We pray for our country pray for leaders at all levels and all ranches who will lead us back to what we ought to be. We pray for Tom and for all those who serve you, that you would give them wisdom and give him the words to speak and encouragement. We pray for all these individuals on the prayer list, these <clears throat> who have been mentioned this morning, victims of these tragedies. We pray for ourselves, for this congregation, and for your church everywhere. We ask for your mercy and your help. We ask for wisdom, stronger faith. In Jesus' name we ask you.
understand and greet each other warmly as Hunter takes his class downstairs. Okay, so let's do that right now. Tom. Oh. I would like to ask for prayer for those people, those families in South Carolina. Oh, okay. yes, okay. The families in South Carolina, the tragedy down there. Thank you, and that's, let's pray for them too. Very much. Let's pray for them right now. Lord, things seem to be tough in this country. Last, well, maybe always. But you're with us and you bless us. But right now, Father, we pray for those in South Carolina that were affected by that tragedy in the church. I can't imagine, Lord, what that would be like. But Father, I pray that your spirit would be with the family members you would comfort them in every way. Lord, be with all of them. Be with all of us. Be with our country, Lord, that we could heal from the things that ail us and turn our hearts back to you. A great revival might sweep this land that it so desperately needs. So hear our prayers, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand and greet each other. Thank <laughs> you. 
the younger son said, give me my share of the estate. And not long after that, he took off. Now, there's nothing wrong with a child leaving home. You know, it's normal and it's natural to do it. It's, it's what's supposed to happen. But we get the impression here in this story that this son left prematurely. You know, what really broke the dad's heart was this kid's attitude towards his father. He couldn't wait to get out. He couldn't wait. You know, he wanted to get away from dad as quick as he could and as far away as possible. He was thoughtless. He was tired of waiting for his dad to die to get his inheritance. He was tired of waiting for his father to divide it up. And he didn't care how it made dad feel. He wandered out. He rejected his father's love. That's sad. That's very sad. So, sons and daughters, if you want to make dad miserable, if you really want to break his heart, just make it clear to him by your actions and your attitudes and your words that you don't care about his love, that you don't want to be around him. When he puts his arm around you, jerk away. You know, jerk away from him. When he tries to give you God, sneer back at him. Oh, you're just an old man. You're old. We don't do things like that anymore. Just make it clear when you were out in the crowd that you're embarrassed by him, that you don't want to be around him. When you have an argument, tell him you hate him. Run away. He'll break his heart. You might think he's tough. You might think he doesn't have feelings, but he does. And you'll break his heart. The second thing this kid did is he wasted what his father gave him. He wasted it. You know, a lot of times, especially in a second generation of a wealthy family, it's hard for them to learn how to handle money. They either squander it, spending freely until there's nothing left, or they're so miserly with it that they hoard it and they worship it. Very rare is the person who can inherit money with the proper balance of appreciation and generosity. You know, if you don't believe that, just look at the thousands of athletes in this country. You know, young men and women, especially men who grew up in, in a ghetto with very poor circumstances, and all of a sudden, you know, they become millionaires overnight because they can do good at whatever sport they're in. And most of the time we read about how it ruined them, how it just tore them up and they got involved with drugs and, and they didn't know how to handle the money. You know, you can make dad miserable by having the wrong attitude towards material things. You know, most of us fathers, which I'm one, we love to give things to our kids. We do. We love to see them light up when we give them a new toy of some kind. And we like to hear them say, thanks, Dad. But it's a sad day. It's a sad day when a dad realizes that he's given his kids too much. Sad day. Very sad. It's a sad day when he realizes he's made his children greedy or materialistic. Even when he realizes they have no appreciation for what he's done for them and what he's worked so hard to give them. You know, in this era of wealth, there's lots of kids who think nothing of wasting their parents' money. And often the time, this type of behavior among children is dad's fault. <clears throat> Many dads grew up having to scrimp, you know, in poverty and save and, and get by with whatever they could. And so when they grow up, we'd say, I want to give my kids better than what I had. And there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes we go overboard or we give it to them too soon. And we create unappreciative offspring. James Dobson wrote this. We are so concerned about giving children what we didn't have when we were growing up that we neglect to give them what we did have. Maybe we didn't have material things, but we did have an appreciation for the value of things and the willingness to work for it. How wise. You know, my dad, my dad's been gone now 11 years. My dad was a plumber, I've told you that before, a working blue collar man. Didn't have health insurance that I know. Never went on a vacation with my dad. He worked all the time. Every day he'd get up and work and he'd come home and have another job and work. I see my dad walk out the door at 6 o'clock in the morning sometimes in such pain with his shoulder and bursitis that he couldn't hardly move. But he went out the door because he had to provide for his family. He's my hero. He's my hero. And I keep thinking to myself, you know, what my dad gave me for me to waste it or squander it would be a sin. It was a sin. 
third thing that this boy did, he violated his dad's moral values. It says he squandered his wealth on wild living. Now we know this man lived contrary to the father's values because when he came back, he said, I've sinned. He knew he had. And every godly father wants his children to know the Lord. Amen? Amen. We want them to know the Lord and to live by biblical standards. We want them to accept Christ as Savior one day. We want them to be honest. We want them to be sexually pure. We want them to stay away from alcohol, drugs. We want them to marry a Christian. We want all these things for our children. You know, an unbeliever will say, each child needs to decide for themselves what is important for them in their life. Oh, really? Well, then that's what they're going to get. Because the world's going to press upon them. You know, do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. <coughs> Be free. Don't impose these old-fashioned values on your children. Times have changed. You know, that's what the world says. But a Christian dad, a Christian dad has been commissioned by the Lord himself to lead his children to respect Christian values. And not to choose their own way, but to choose God's way. Amen. That's what we're here for, people. To teach our children to choose God's way. Amen. The teaching of Scripture are true. And it's not to satisfy the ego of the father, but it's for the child's sake that we teach things like that. We want our children to obey those standards, and it breaks a godly dad's heart to see his child, whether grown or young, flagrantly violating his moral teachings, treating his values and principles and beliefs with contempt. And when this, father, when this happens, a dad naturally asks himself, where did I go wrong? Oh my goodness, what did I do wrong? You know, but a child has a free will also. We do the best we can. So if you want to break that, you know, those are the ways to do it. That's the way this kid in the parable did it. That's how we break it. And you know, and it's interesting. That's the same way we break our Heavenly Father's heart too. Don't you see? It, it's the same way. You know, we break our Heavenly Father's heart when we withdraw our love from Him. When we say, oh, God, you know, I really don't want you around here. I'm going to go into this place right now. I'm going to watch this on TV. Would you please just dis disappear for a minute? You know, when we don't want to be around Him, when we'd rather be somewhere else, when we get excited about a ball game or a picnic, but when we have an opportunity to spend some time with the Lord, you know, we come into His presence like we're going in to have a root canal or something. It's obvious we don't want to be there. That breaks God's heart. And we break his heart when we carelessly and without any thought whatsoever waste what he has given us. He's given us everything. Look around. We have everything. We live in a country. We have freedom. We have material things. We have food. We have shelter. We have clothing. You know, not only that, but he's given us his word. We have a Bible we can read and, tur and, and turn to anytime we need to encourage it. We have prayer. What a privilege to be able to talk to God anytime we want to. He's given us that right. The Bible teaches, brothers and sisters, we are completely free to enter the most holy place without fear because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And we break God's heart when we violate his commands. Jesus said, if you love me, you obey my commands in John 14. So children have the potential of breaking dad and crushing his heart, but we also have the same potential to do that to God. Now, how to make a dad. Yeah, how to make a dad. Let's continue on with the parable. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. 
I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Man, what a turnaround. Look what happened to this boy, how he made his dad. First of all, he sought his father's fellowship. He had rejected it earlier. He rejected the love. But now he desires it. He was in a far country. There's a famine. His money is gone. He takes a job feeding pigs. He says, wait a minute here. What am I doing? My father's servants have more to eat than I have. I'm going back, and, and I'm going to tell him, Dad, I'm sorry. I've blown it. So he sought his dad's fellowship. The second thing is he now respected his dad's authority. Have you ever noticed the difference between the way this kid left and the way he came back? He left well-dressed. <clears throat> he came back in rags. He left clean. He came back dirty. He left pure. He came back tainted with sin. He left in a Porsche. He came back in a Yugo. <laughs> He left arrogantly saying, give me, give me, give me. He came back humbly saying, make me your servant. <clears throat> the son came back with a humble spirit, respecting his dad's authority. If you want to make your dad's day, people, show him respect. Do what he asks you to do. Instead of ridiculing him and make fun of his flaws, defend him in public. Compliment him. Colossians says, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Show respect for your dad. In Proverbs 23, the father of a righteous man has great joy. He who has a wise son delights in him. And this kid also had this, and this is another way of making your dad have a positive spirit. When the father saw the son humbly coming up the path, what did he do? He ran to meet him. You know, God is always anxious to forgive us, too. Young people, if you want to bring joy to your father, have a positive attitude in your home. You know, many kids laugh and carry on with their friends, but the minute they walk through the door, it's like, mm. they go up to the room, shut the door, you never see them again. Their countenance drops. It's like they're going to jail for a time until they can get out again, go back to their friends. <coughs> they go to the room, they hibernate, they grumble, they complain, they're short with their parents. They don't want to go on vacation because you're square. You're a bore. You know, but it's a real sign of maturity, young people, when you can be with your parents and have a good time and show them positive support and love. It can be done. I see it all the time. I see it all the time. I saw it yesterday. Dallas and Laura Beth with their dad, Jeff, hiking on that mountain. They're laughing together. They're having a good time together. They're puffing up a mountain, soared together. It was a beautiful thing to watch, and I see it in this church all the time. That's the way it's supposed to be. So we make our dads when we seek his fellowship and respect his authority, and we have a positive spirit. These are the very things that gladden our Heavenly Father's heart, too. He wants us to seek his presence. We delight God when we respect his authority, submitting to his lordship, and are obedient to his word. We bring joy to God when we have a positive spirit in the church and in fellowship. If we have a cynical attitude, it hurts him. It hurts him. If there's no joy or excitement or enthusiasm, it grieves the Father's heart. The Bible says over and over again that we are to come into his presence with singing. We're to come into his presence with joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Our positive attitude brings joy to our Heavenly Father. You know, again, on Father's Day, you know, it's always a tough thing to what to talk about on these kind of holidays. Because I know as well as you do. Not everybody had a good father. I know that. I wasn't born last night. That's why we have a saying called deadbeat dads. You know, I'm, I'm sorry about that. 
if you had a father that wasn't that great to you, I am sorry. But it was not God's fault. That was not God's plan. And when you say the word father, when I say God is your heavenly father, some of you may cringe. You say, father? Ooh, I don't know that. Let me tell you, God the Father has a perfect love for you. No matter what your earthly father did or didn't do, or no matter how good he was or how bad he was, you have a heavenly father who gave his son's life so that you could be with him. He wants nothing more than to have a relationship with you forever. He has given everything to make that happen, to give you and I the opportunity for that. I hope you had a great earthly father. I really do. I did. I was blessed by it. And through my earthly father, I could see my heavenly father. My earthly father told me about my heavenly father. If you don't know this heavenly father we're talking about, we're going to have a time of invitation, we call it. It's an invitation not from me. It's not an invitation from the elders of the church or the deacons or anybody else. It's an invitation from God himself Amen. for you to accept this gift of love. And you do that by coming forward here and unashamedly telling everybody, yes, I want to know this Father. I want to know Him forever. And you confess His name. You repent of your sins. You're baptized up there in the water, symbolizing the death of your old self and the resurrection of the new self. And then you have the Holy Spirit come into you. And you can be with this Heavenly Father who loves you. And you can be with Him forever. So we're going to pray. As I pray, Charlie and instrumentalists will come up, and then we're going to stand and we're going to sing. So pray with me. Christians, you pray with me too. Lord, thank you for being our Father. Thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity to be with you forever and ever through the Son that you gave us. He gave his life on the cross, tortured to death, you proved your love for us through that. You proved your power. I pray, Lord, for someone here today that does not know you as Savior. That this would be the day, this would be the hour, this would be the minute that they make that decision. So you'd be with them. Knock any walls down that are holding them back. Lord, I thank you for yourself and who you are. Thank you for loving me when I'm not lovable. Thank you for all you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me? Sing with me. If you have a need to make this decision, please come. Thank you. Right now.
somewhere where you see it. You know, if you carry it with you in your pocket or in your car or somewhere in the house. Every time you see it, I, I want you to thank God for what you have for your children. Say a prayer for them. They're growing up in a world that's a little bit crazy. So we as dads, we need to, we need to step it up too. So God bless everyone. Ron Donk, would you close today? Sure. Lord, we want to thank you for this day. We want to thank you for our fathers. We know that everyone hasn't had a great father, as Tom said. But we do know that we have a father in heaven who is the greatest of all. He gave Jesus so that we could be saved.